All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At least it's afternoon for me. Um, we're going to talk today about the LAC operon. In this unit, we've been talking about DNA and DNA structure. We've talked about transcription, how RNA is made from the DNA, um, and how that mRNA travels out to the um, ribosome. And translation is when we the trucks pull up and they make our proteins. Um, what we're gonna do in this set of notes is talk about how our genes get turned on and off. Maybe you remember from a previous unit when, he talk, when we talked about um, something that's called um, telomerase and a gene called telomerase that turns on and off. It's supposed to be off most of the time, but it's turned on in your um, white blood cells. So the question is, how is it that our genes turn on and off? Um, we're gonna give you an example of a really simple gene that's found in a bacteria called E. coli. Um, the reason we use bacterial DNA is that it's a lot simpler than human DNA, and so it'll just give us the idea of how it is that genes could be turned on or off. So we'll go ahead and start right here. Okay, so the cell doesn't want to waste energy building proteins it doesn't need, so it has mechanisms to turn genes on and off, and the mechanism we're going to talk about is the LAC operon. Um, let me just give you the, the general idea here. Um, if I put um, a whole bunch of um, E. coli bacteria into a bowl of milk. They will want to digest the lactose sugar that's in that bowl of milk. So they're gonna start producing a series of enzymes that, that are made of protein um, that allow them to digest that milk. But if instead I take those E. coli and I dump them into a bowl of water, the last thing they wanna do is start making the enzymes for digesting lactose, because that would be a waste of energy. If all of our genes were activated at the same time, we would immediately run out of energy. It would be deadly for us. Um, so our bodies have to have these feedback systems where we can activate some DNA and deactivate other DNA. And that's what we're gonna talk about with the, the LAC operon. It stands for lactose operon. Um, so let's go through a few words to make sure we're clear on this. So first of all, the word operon refers to several genes that are transcribed together. Remember, that means that RNA polymerase reads them. Um, but in this case, it's a whole bunch that are read at the same time. Take a look at the diagram in the upper right-hand corner. Um, do you see where it says DNA? Um, and then it's got a series of boxes that are linked together. Those boxes represent the double helix of our DNA, and it's a several genes that are found on one chromosome. In this case, um, it's a DNA chromosome, but I, I don't really wanna differentiate that much between a bacteria versus a human chromosome. At, not at this point, at least. Okay, so anyway, um, all these genes are found in the operon on that one chromosome. The operon is a whole bunch of them that get read together. A structural gene, and those are the ones that are bright green that say LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. A structural gene is any gene that codes for a protein specifically. Not all genes code for proteins. For example, the O, um, if you see the red section that has the letter O on that, that's um, the operator, and that's just a place where the repressor can sit, but it doesn't actually code for, a, it doesn't code for DNA, I'm sorry, it doesn't code for a protein. And the PLAC, the gene, um, that's orange right now, that's just a place for the RNA polymerase to sit. It's not actually coding for um, a protein. All right, and then the last word um, on this page that we wanna make sure you know is the word repressor. The repressor in the diagram is the blue Lego piece, um, and the repressor works like a roadblock. It is a protein that attaches to DNA, literally hugs onto the DNA, and stops the RNA polymerase, that gray oval, from reaching the structural gene. So it gets in the way, and it does not allow the DNA to untwist and um, unzip so that the RNA polymerase can get in there. All right, so let's take a look at what's gonna happen. Um, an operator, and I know the red writing is a little hard to um, read, um, but I'm trying to match it to the red gene on the DNA diagram. Um, so the operator is that one that has an O. It's the on-off switch, and that's where the repressor protein sits. If the repressor protein is on there, then we say the gene is off. If the repressor protein falls off, then we say the gene is on. Kind of sounds reverse. The promoter site is that orange gene, and that's just where the RNA polymerase sits. It's sort of a place that says, come here, RNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase knows to go there, and that's going to be where it starts to begin its transcription if the repressor protein is out of the way. The regulatory gene, I just mentioned it. Um, 
a lot of times students want to know, well, where did the repressor, that Lego piece, where does it come from in the first place? Well, it's a protein, so it came from somewhere else in the DNA. So upstream of the rest of the LAC operon is this regulator gene that codes for the repressor. So the repressor protein gets made earlier, and it's floating around, ready to snap onto the um, operator, the on-off switch. Okay, and finally is the hot pink little oval um, that we're going to call the inducer. An inducer is any molecule that when it attaches to the repressor, it causes the repressor's shape to change. Now, they don't literally look like Lego pieces, but the shape is absolutely instrumental to how they work. When it's in the Lego shape, they snap together and that roadblock gets in the way of the RNA polymerase. But when the, um, when the inducer is present, in this case, the inducer is called allolactose or lactose. When it's present and it touches the repressor, the repressor changes shape. It's like it melts or something. And it no longer fits the way Lego pieces would fit. Um, in this case, the enzymes are no, able, no longer able to fit together. So it falls off and it's no longer in the way of the RNA polymerase. All right, now I don't expect that you've understood pretty much anything that I've said, but I'm hoping the second time through it'll start to pull together. This diagram is right out of your textbook. When lactose is not present, so if I drop these E. coli into a bowl of water, this is what should happen. The operon should be turned off. That roadblock, that repressor is sitting in front of it. It's um, on the operator and it prevents the RNA polymerase from moving across to gene one, two, and three. So we don't make those proteins and E. coli doesn't lose um, waste energy. However, if lactose is present, if I take those E. coli and I drop them in a bowl of milk, lactose, do you see the little inducer molecule that's attached to the repressor? That inducer attaches to the repressor and causes the repressor to change shape. It falls off. The purple RNA polymerase can now move across the genes and it can read gene one, gene two, and gene three. Um, now this diagram jumps a bunch of critical steps, but that's okay. They're just trying to condense the idea here. So it says mRNA is made, it travels out of the nucleus, it heads to a ribosome, and then what it doesn't show at all are the trucks pulling up with their amino acids and the amino acids bonding together. But regardless, they make these three proteins repeatedly, not just three proteins, but they're three different proteins that get made repeatedly needed to digest the lactose. And so that is going to continue until that bowl of milk um, has been, all the lactose has been removed or until the, um, until the E. coli are full. There's a video here that I'm going to encourage you to watch because it's a really good video, but I won't show it right now. And I just wanted to mention this last thing. What happens if lactose is present, but the E. coli isn't hungry. Kind of cool. I'm going to include this on the test, um, kind of a critical thinking kind of question on the test. When an E. coli already has lots of energy, levels of a special I'm hungry signal molecule fall. So I want you to take a look at the diagram and what you're looking for in the very bottom corner, um, very bottom row, is um, a cap, what's called cap. Um, cap is a um, I'm hungry molecule that has a little green piece stuck in it. So cap is an activator protein that unwinds the DNA. And if it has the I'm hungry molecule in it, it will unwind the DNA. If the I'm hungry molecule isn't there, then it won't unwind the DNA and nothing can happen. So let's take a look at the four possibilities. If there's um, glucose and lactose present, this means that lactose is present, but the E. coli has already eaten, it already got glucose, so it's not hungry. So notice that the operon is off because cap is not there and there's no repressor in the, in, in, there's no need for the repressor to be there. Um, notice in the second part, um, the, the E. coli has had plenty of glucose, but there's no lactose present. So there's no reason to make these proteins to donate or to, to digest lactose if they're not gonna, um, if there's no lactose present in the first place. I gotta hurry because I'm running out of time. In the third example, um, the E. coli is hungry. It doesn't have any glucose, but there's no lactose present. So again, there's no point in actually making um, the enzymes for digesting lactose. It's only in the fourth example um, where lactose is present and there's no glucose. So this little E. coli is hungry. Um, so the RNA polymerase sits on, cap is there with the I'm hungry signal. It unwinds the DNA. RNA polymerase is there. There's no repressor in the way. It travels across, it makes the three proteins for digesting um, lactose. Um, so only in that fourth circumstance. So try to look at that um, diagram. I think there's information in your, um, in your book about it also. So um, take a look at that and see if you can figure it out. That's it, everybody.
having trouble getting this to end. Hold on just a second. 